with various. Thank you for that. Right, so she often facilitates behavioral management workshops with various schools across the island. Her primary research interests are in childhood depression and trauma. Dr. Swaby is a Christian who actively participates in camps and retreats where she serves as a, a counselor to the young and the young at heart. At this time, I'm gonna turn over the rest of this evening's discussion to, to our presenter, Dr. Megan Swaby. Dr. Swaby, it's over to you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I hope Good the evening. choir is on this evening, you know. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Swaby. All right, it is good to be here with you this evening, and I look forward to an interactive session. I thank the powers that be for this invitation. I love everything that has to do with mental health because it, I believe it is such an important and critical part of our lives. So let me share screens. All right, is everyone seeing my screen clearly? Yes. All right, awesome. Now, this evening I was asked for us to spend some time talking about working in a stressful environment. And if it is anything we know in Jamaica, we know about stress, right? No I don't think that's to... common to Jamaica. <laughs> we, we know, I know, I know it's not only a Jamaican thing, but certainly we in Jamaica know about it because we attribute everything to stress. I am hungry. Try a man me stress out right now. I am not getting through with something. Stress. So we tend to use the term quite loosely. Now, to begin this evening, I'm going to ask that we participate in an activity. I'm going to be placing you in two groups and you will have 10 minutes. Group one, I'm asking you to describe what a stressful work environment looks like to you. And group two, I want you to describe the ideal work environment. Now, when you come back from the breakout rooms, well, when you go to the breakout rooms, decide who will be reporting on your behalf. And at the end of 10 minutes, when we rejoin into the main room, then we will hear what the, dis what your, your, what the discussions um, came up with. Are there any questions before we go to the breakout rooms? Okay.
um, Dr. Suebe? Yes. Oh, sorry. Someone missed the instructions properly. I want to make sure I'm, I'm telling you the right thing. Could you just repeat for me? All right. So breakout, breakout room one, mm -hmm. describe as what a stressful work environment looks like. And breakout room two, describe the ideal work environment. All right. Thank you, Doc. You're welcome.
Okay, everyone, welcome back to the main room. So let's hear from group one. Your task was to describe what you consider to be a stressful work environment. Mm. All right, good evening, everyone. So I'm Tamika, I was part of group one. I will share a few pointers that my teammates came up with as to what will um, a stressful work, working environment looks like. So um, it was mentioned that where there is a lack of communication or you know lack of coordination for responsibilities and the, the functional roles of the employees, and that could all also cause employees to become, you know, uninterested in doing their work. It was also stated that, you know, where there is no defined workstation for the individual to work. And also where there is a, where there is, um, a lack of, so, sorry, not where there is a lack, but say where the work, it's hectic and it's routine, but at the same time, it is not really able to bring out the expertise that the employee has within them, right? Um, inadequate staffing as well was mentioned. Um, another one that was mentioned was having targets that are not really, um, let me see, I didn't write this down properly. All right, let me see. So it's having targets that that are not really where, where the goal, sorry. Um, let me just get my thoughts here together. I didn't write this down properly. David, I know you're there. You're hearing me. You want to help me out? All right. It's not. Having it's targets. Having, oh. Sorry, I was saying having targets where the goals um, are several and keep changing. Keep changing, right. And then there's another point about the capacity of the staff cannot, I guess, handle what it is that they are to do. Right. So the team leader feels burdened because the staff that is placed with them is not able to carry out the function. So at the end of the day, it's like everything is rest on that team leader. So those were um, a few of the pointers that we came up to as to, you know, what a stressful environment will look like or what it is. Thank you, group one. For the members in group two, is there anything you can think of that you would add? I know that was not what you discussed, but just from listening, anything that you would add to say this you believe will be a part of what a stressful work environment looks like? Yes, go ahead. Um, working and not getting paid, sorry. Yes, working and not getting paid, yes. Go ahead, Mr. Dunk, I'm seeing your hand up. Because there's a situation where you're expected to work beyond the hours of public transportation and you don't have transportation for yourself and the company refuses to facilitate getting you home to expect you to show up for on time every day. All right, thank you. And I'm seeing Tamara Amos Williams, holy something. Go ahead, Tamara. Holy Trinity, hi. Good mm -hmm. afternoon, Doc. Good afternoon. Yes, when, for example, for me, a stressful environment looks like um, you enter the school compound and it's not yet lunchtime, but the students are all over the place. Yeah, that is stressful because you need to get them back inside. And you know, some of the students will not adhere to whatever instruction you might give. So that's stressful for me. All right, thank you. All right, so we jump over now to group two. Thank you, group one. Group two, what would you consider the ideal work environment to look like? All right, good evening, Dr. Sylvia. Uh, Joel Holding here. Um, so we discussed that 
what an ideal environment, work environment would look like is that um, it is conflict free. Also, uh, another person mentioned about an ideal work day um, for them would be when everyone does what they are supposed to do, communicate ahead of time, when they will be late or unavailable, when your supervisor supports you, when you have the right tools to do the job and enough time to get it done without turning your hand to make fashion. <laughs> and an environment where everyone is mature enough to understand that you know everyone has their opinion, um, persons collaborate ideas and get the, the, the work done effectively. Also resources, to have resources available um, and when, or possibly if the resources are accessible at all times to complete lesson, to complete the lesson plan in the classroom without no disruption um, from the students, um, adequate staffing for the work to be done, good work, work ethics among staff, um, having proper feedback from management, staff showing up to work to do the work and show up on time. Just to name a few, because it's a lot. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Mr. Holding. And I'm seeing two hands already, Nikisha Barnes and then Andrea Williams. In that order, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope you're hearing me. I had some headset difficulties earlier. Everybody hearing? Yes, we're hearing clearly. Thank you so much. Um, I like what was just presented and I want to tell the group, great job. I think one concern for me was that idea of having a conflict-free space. Yeah. I think in the learnings I've done, you recognize that you, you will never have a conflict-free space. What we have to recognize is that conflict can be positive and conflict can cause you to pull from people their best that they have to contribute to a team. And I think that's what I wanted to contribute in terms of us understanding that conflict is not always negative and it doesn't have to mean that it's something bad that you avoid. It can be something that causes us as team members, whether managers or leaders, to pull on our teams to get the very best from the team. And it may be that in that moment, somebody has something to say, but because of the fear of what conflict means to them, they don't contribute to the team successfully. Um, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Insightful and interesting. Thank you. Um, there was another hand. I'm not seeing it anymore. Was it Andrea Williams? I think it was. All right, so the, for, um, for the members in group. Um, sorry. Yes. Sorry, um, Andrea here. Yes, yes, it was my hand, but I took it down because Nikisha apparently was reading my script. <laughs> oh, it says wise minds think alike. <laughs> right, I was gonna say the same thing. All right, awesome, thank you. So the members, okay. the, mem the, the members were in group one. Is there anything you would like to add to say what the ideal work environment would look like? All right, so I'm no I've noted the comment in the chat as it relates to conflict as well. All right, so. Um, for, for me, Andrea here again, mm -hmm. for me, what the ideal um, environment would look like is, yes, we are a team. And remember our team is as strong as our weakest link. So we ought to be able to work together as a team to lift up work on, I believe in working in and bringing out the strengths of individual team members, use them at their best, and for areas that they're weak in, we build on that. We work together and build on that to bring them up to the level that we want our team to be. Awesome, thank you very much. And thank you everyone for sharing. So my next question is, how do you know when you are stressed?
May I go, please? Yes. Okay, so for me, when I'm stressed, I usually get a pain in the back of my neck and I find myself getting very irritable. All right, thank you, Mrs. Willis. Anyone else? How do you know when you are stressed? Yes, uh, Ms. Williams, go ahead, please. Oh, I had that last week. I get pains in different parts of my body. So like last week, when I, I'm at work and I'm limping, but I did not know what was causing the limping. And so what it took for me to realize what was happening was on the weekend, I just laid down and did nothing. Mm -hmm. And this week I am fine. Awesome, thank you for sharing that. Go ahead, Gail Reed. Right, I, I don't sleep well. <laughs> so I wake up really, really early, like after three and just can't go back to sleep. All right, so but, insomnia, not insomnia. able to sleep well. Yeah. All right, thank you. Annetta, go ahead, please. Good evening. Sorry to be late. Tomorrow is my big day, so I just come from the needle check. Oh, <laughs> I'm me graduating me. tomorrow from college. Oh, yeah. I thought it was. Um, oh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, when I'm stressed, I'm restless, like, you know, as a lady mentioned earlier, sleep, you know, sleepless, and um, also frigid tea. And it's just a different feeling than my usual self. And I know I'm stressed out, like overwork, you know, burden, drain, everything. And then that something lead to anger, like I just get frustrated with people. I don't want to see nobody here, nobody, bite them nothing. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, yeah, Tamara, okay. Tamara, can I ask you to hold your point a minute, please? Is my choir ready? Yes. Is my choir ready? Where's my choir? We don't have the choir. Yes, we are. All right, so we have someone among us, Annetta, she's, she's graduating from college tomorrow. Can we sing for She's a Jolly Good Fellow? As a means of us extending congratulations to her. My choir. Congratulations. So let's go one, two, four. She's a Jolly Good Fellow. 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 Hooray! Hooray! Hooray. 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 Thank you, thank you, so thank you very much. congratulate you, you on this success and we celebrate with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, our choir. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tamara, go ahead, please. Um, a few of my colleagues mentioned um, what I was about to speak on and that is sleepless night as well as I become very irritable I don't want to see anybody around um, and so I would lash out so that's when I know that I am stressed all right thank you so thank you everyone so then from participating in the first activity talking about what a stressful environment looks like, what an ideal um, working environment looks like, plus identifying symptoms that tell us personally that we are stressed. It says to us that all of us can relate with the topic this evening. And so for our discussion this evening, as we consider the whole concept of working in a stressful environment, I want us to focus on what I have um, named the unique three. And these are our assumptions, our expectations, and our perceptions. Now, when we think of our assumptions, we all have them. We are referring to the beliefs that we have about the world. So putting it in our context for this evening, we're referring to the beliefs that we have about our workplaces. The beliefs that we have to say what should happen in a workplace. Added to these assumptions, we have certain expectations. We have expectations of those in management. 
We have expectations of ourselves. We have expectations of those whom we may supervise. We have expectations of our colleagues, what we hope will happen. And adding to that, we also have certain perceptions. So when things happen, based on what our assumptions are and what our expectations are, then we walk away from the different experiences with certain perceptions. We interpret our perceptions differently. Consider this. There can be two individuals working at the same place and the beliefs that they have about that workplace are totally different. They can have the same experiences, but one can think that this environment is toxic and it is stressful. And the other person can think this working environment is just what I needed. It is helping me to grow. It is helping me to tap into my inner resources and it is making me into a better person. And all of that has to do with what our personal assumptions are, what our expectations are, and how we interpret the different experiences that we have. Does that sound like it makes sense? Talk to me. Yes, it does. Okay. Yes, it does. Yes, All right. Does. I want us to keep this in mind as we move through our assumptions, which fuel what our expectations are, and then our expectations that help us to interpret the different experiences that we have. But life is not always like that. Sometimes our assumptions are not met. The things that I assumed would happen, they have not happened. So when I signed up for this particular job, I expected that this job will help me to develop on the skill set that I came to this company with. Because when the advertisement was out, they said they wanted persons with X, Y, and Z. And I have, I am fully qualified and have experience in X, Y, and Z. So now that I am here, I am expecting, my assumption is that the tasks that are going to be assigned to me will tap into this skill set. I am also expecting that being a valued um employee then additional training will be provided so that my i can develop on my skill set or i can share some of what i have and then also you know my per my expectations may be dashed or my perceptions are shattered so the experiences that i am having within a particular company has nothing to do with what my assumptions were. They are far removed from it. So I find myself now in a situation where I am being given tasks to do that has nothing to do with my skill set, and I am expecting to deliver. I find that I am in, a, in, a, in an environment where the goalpost keeps moving ever so regularly. I find that I am in an environment where the experiences that I thought I would have had, I am not having those, those experiences. So our assumptions are, are not met, our expectations are dashed, and our perceptions are shattered, shattered. When these things happen, we respond. As human beings, we respond. We think, we feel, and we behave. So we respond in our thoughts. We begin to think. Why did I take this job? I don't like this environment. And we begin to think a lot of thoughts. And most times, it is usually negative thinking. Now, remember something that we said last week. We, we, we spoke about the tripartite relationship that exists among our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors. And so once we begin to think negatively, then it is going to begin to affect how we feel. And how we feel, it is going to come out in our behaviors. So we begin to think that, you know, boy, I am not being satisfied in this job. I am not living up to my expectations. I feel stuck and all of that. 
and then all of the negative emotions. When I ask, how do you know when you're stressed, you're not able to sleep. For some persons, they begin to feel physical pain because stress is a mind body, has a mind body relationship. The thoughts that comes from the mind, it affects how we feel, it affects our emotions. And then many times we begin to feel the physical pains in our body, psychosomatic pains. For some persons, they spend thousands of dollars going to the doctor. Remember one colleague shared earlier that she was limping, she had a pain and she did not know what it was until she took the time on the weekend to rest and do nothing. And then she could recognize that, oh, the pain is gone. Then she could, I guess from her reflection, she recognized that it was stress that she was feeling. So stress therefore is a response to our thoughts and to our emotions. So how we feel when we say we feel stressed, it is the body telling us that something has gone wrong. Something has happened. The, 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 the relationship that exists among our thoughts and our feelings and our, and our behavior, something has gone wrong there. And at this point, our bodies are reacting. So we get the headaches. Some persons begin to have breakouts on their faces. You find that some persons cannot sleep or some persons begin to sleep too much. Some persons cannot eat or some persons begin to eat too much. Can anyone relate with these symptoms? Yes, yes. definitely. Right, so stress then is a response. No, we are not always cognizant of what we are thinking. As a matter of fact, most times we do not know what we're thinking but we always know how we are feeling. We always know when we're sad. We always know when we're happy. If we're anxious, we know. If we're just feeling aware, like, you know, Jamaicans have that feeling, boy, I may just feel aware, we know. So we, we always know how we're feeling, but as we have been saying since last week, the origin of how we're feeling in any given moment is really in our thoughts, is what we have been thinking mm. about. So our thoughts then are the evaluation and perception of the events, the perceptions that we draw from our experiences, how we evaluate our experiences. I think I used this example somewhere recently, I don't remember if it was with your group, that if the boss, if you get a message that the boss would like to see you, most times, most persons begin to think, Lord Jesus, I will me do now. We always go off thinking, forming negative perception, a negative evaluation of what those experiences might be. Now, psychologists tell us that every day we have between 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts per day. I don't know who counted it. <laughs> But that's what they say, and I know I am not going to be able to prove it or dispute it, so I just take what they say as it relates to this. So if we have 60,000, let's just imagine that this is true. If we have 60, 000, anywhere from 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts per day, and I'm coming, Ms. Johnson, and, these, and most of these thoughts are negative, can you imagine what is going to happen to us when we consider the tripartite relationship that we have been talking about among our thoughts, our feelings, and our behaviors? Go ahead, Miss Johnson. Hello, good night, Miss. You just made a. You said we always know how we are feeling, and we always know if we are feeling sad and unhappy. I, I, I just want to throw a scenario out to you, most. Oftentimes you'll hear people say that they're depressed. I feel yeah. depressed. I feel yeah. depressed today. And it, I, I am a, a clinical social worker. Yes. And I normally will say to some of my clients, you're not depressed. You're feeling sad. What do you think about that, Liz? All right. So it's, a, it's how we talk. I do not know if it is true for other cultures, but I know in Jamaica, for the, for the average person, when they talk about feeling depressed, 
it's not, they're not referring to clinical depression. What they're referring to is just having a low feeling that is as a result of something. It is situational and maybe within a few hours or you know, once the situation changes, then they bounce right back. Or sometimes even if the situation does not change, they bounce right back. So um, I understand that from a cultural standpoint, we tend to use the term depressed loosely. So, so I'm not to take it. Uh, that, that's that's how I I normally feel. Well, I'm from Saint Vincent and the Grenadines. Okay. So, it's just that I find that when people it's too loosely used. You yes. go around every day. You, I'm depressed. I'm depressed. Yes. And in my in my estimation, I think oftentimes it is you feel sad. You feel a little off. Yes. But depression is a far deep thing too. Yes. So just, so, I just wanted to hear your take on it. Right. So when we're when we're in the professional sphere, once someone say I am depressed, you're going to assess to see the severity of it. Is this just that the person is feeling, you know, sad and blue because of something that has happened? Or is there any evidence that this person may be experiencing clinical depression? And if it is that you are in a counseling session per se, then you have certain screening tools that you can use. So for example, um, Beck's Depression Inventory, yes. which is a screening yeah. tool that can be administered right there in the counseling session, just to see if this, what this person is experiencing is just being sad and blue, or if there is any evidence of clinical depression. Okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Now, so if we have 60,000 to 80,000 thoughts per day, and most of these thoughts are negative, considering what we have said, that our thoughts determine how we feel and how we feel determines how we behave, and that stress is a response to our thoughts and our feelings, then you can imagine that we are going to be feeling extremely overwhelmed and extremely stressed. Now, to manage stress then, now that we have established that, in working in an environment that we may not consider to be ideal, to manage stress, we do what we refer to as let go of stinking thinking. Let go of stinking thinking. And I see some person's face going, did she just say stinking thinking? Yes, I did. And you ask, then our name, so what is stinking thinking? And I'm so happy that you have asked that question. Stinking thinking is irrational thinking. Thinking that says things must be this way, our things should be this way. Once we have that mindset that things must be a particular way, we are going to find that we are always experiencing negative emotions because we're dealing with human beings and human beings are dynamic. We are not able to control somebody else's behaviors or their thoughts and they're able to do what they think. But if I think that this boss must do this, or if the boss does not do this, then it's going to be chaos. When the boss does not do that, what you thought, then you're going to panic. And you're going to be anxious and you're going to be experiencing negative emotions. Now, stinking thinking is also thoughts that are based on our expectations. How many times we have had expectations that have not been met? Can anyone identify with that? I expected that I would have gotten a raise of pay. I expected that when Miss Brown retired, I would have been appointed to the next supervisor. I expected that if the goals for this project are the objectives of this project were going to change, then the supervisor would have told me, I expected X, Y, and Z, I expected A, B, and C, and none of that happened. Can anyone relate? Yes, I can relate. All right, so thank you. So 
thoughts that are based on expectations, when these expectations do not materialize, then we find that we begin to experience negative emotions. And once we begin to have these negative emotions, they are going to affect us physically. And so we are going to find that we are stressed. Thoughts with no evidence to support them. The word support is missing. Thoughts with no evidence to support them. Sometimes the biggest source of our stress are the conversations that we have in our head. We have some of these conversations. You see when him call me, I am going to say so and so. But if she had said A and B, but I don't understand why she never did that. No, I am going to say to her, you know, I think that what you did was wrong. But then again, I'm not going to say anything. I'll let everybody live their own lives. I can't bother because next thing I go and say something, you hear that and we keep having these ruminating thoughts. We have these thoughts going over and over and over in our heads and big conversations going on in our heads. There is no evidence to support that the conversations that we're having, that they are true. And so we feel burdened down. We begin to feel listless. We begin to feel tired because we are engaging in stinking thinking. Now, what are some specific examples of stinking thinking? Edith, did you want to say something? Okay, I guess not. First one, mental, mental filtering. Magnifying the negatives while ignoring the positives. Now, if you look at the picture. Edith? Yes. Uh, go ahead, please. It is. Are you talking to us, Edith? All right, I'm not sure what's happening, so let's mute Edith for now. All right, so mental, mental filtering. If you look at what is happening in the picture, you have a lot of good, one, two, three, four, five, six good things over on this side that the body is calling to the brain and say, brain, look. But over on the other side, there is one bad thing. And the bad thing is so small that the brain is using a magnifying glass to see it. But when the brain is, when the body is calling to the brain to say, look at all of these good things, it is saying, not now. Can't you see I am busy? So one form of stinking thinking in, is mental filtering, where we magnify the negatives while ignoring the positives. So when we talk about our work environment, I'm not saying that things are ideal. I'm not saying that things are how we would like them to be. But if we are honest sometimes and just take the time to look, we will recognize that not only um, stress, it, the situation does not only have some of the stressful things or the environment does not have just some of the stressful things that you listed out earlier in the opening activity, but they also have some of the things that we consider to be necessary for us to have an ideal working environment. It is not always bad. So it goes back again to what we were talking about, our perceptions and our expectations and how we interpret things. But then we have this tendency of always ignoring the positives and magnifying the negatives. So I'm going to ask you to do something for me now. I want you to type in the chat, everybody or all those who can, one good thing about your workplace. So do we then expect nothing but make just in case plans then take things as they come. I'm not sure if I understand. Um, Mr. Dunk, I'm not sure if I understand what you wrote. 
So maybe you could unmute and explain for unmute your microphone and explain for us. All right, so I'm so seeing. What I was working. saying, can you hear me? Yes. So what I was saying is, since um, if we have expectations based on something that someone said to us, right? Yes. And then we had that conversation with ourselves in our head, making our plans. Um, and then the expectations are not met. And the must and shoulds that we came up with, they all fell through. And now we're upset. So I'm saying if we just expect nothing, but say, you know, if they do this, I will do that. And if they don't do this, I'll do that instead. So I just make like a plan. Whatever happens, this is what I'm going to do. No. And so. No, I, no, it's not like, and I'm sorry to cut, cut in on you. It's not yeah. like you're going to say, well, if I have no expectations, I cannot be disappointed. No, it's not like that. Yes, you're, look at the context that you said. If you have expectations based on what was said to you, that is different from you just, because this is how you think, you expect that thing should be a particular way. I hope that that makes the difference. But if I say to you, uh, Mr. Dung, this is what I'm going to do, then clearly you're going to expect that I'm going to hold up my end of the bargain. But I, that's not what I'm talking about in terms of expectations. I'm talking about expectations that are based on my assumptions, which many times we have no evidence. All right, I'm seeing a number of responses in the chat. Let's see if I can go through quickly. Togetherness. Um, they take self-care seriously, self-growth. You get to use your clinical skills, continuous learning, flexibility. I get a lot of jokes. You know, like I need a job here because I've been trying to learn how to tell some good jokes and I, I'm just not getting it. Um, some of the, the teens that I work with in the summer, they have, be, they have given me a nickname, half a laugh, because when I try to give a joke, they said it does not deserve a full laugh, so they give me a half a laugh. Um, so we get to improvise, team efforts, clean. All right, beautiful. So I'm seeing a, a lot of positives as it relates to all right, so Robert and Joel, I need to make an, make an appointment with you to learn at your feet about telling jokes. So I'm seeing a lot, of the, a lot of positive things as it relates to our workplaces. So then um, my encouragement, the first point is that to help us to navigate our work environments that may not be ideal is that we stop this thinking, thinking of mental filtering. We do not only focus on the negative stuff, but we spend some time doing our evaluation and also focus on the positive stuff. And my time is almost up. Time, is, time goes quickly when you're having fun. The next one is mind reading. Now, we have this tendency to believe that we know exactly what the other person is thinking. Go ahead, Andrea Williams. Ms. Williams? Yeah, um, I'm just listening to what you're saying and trying to relate it to a situation that happened with me, whereby I am sent an email from my manager to say that reagents came. But that same email was sent to an overseas supplier. Now I'm going through and I'm trying to pick out the positives in that. Why? Because that email went to an overseas supplier, but I am right here in the same building with the manager. So I'm wondering, so why would you send an email to me when you could have just called me and tell me? Because the manager is a perfect, imperfect person and make mistakes just like all the rest of us do. 
Yes, you're even though that's not the first time it happened. How many times have you done one thing that is wrong more than once? Well, maybe you have a point there. But is it that my expectation, maybe um, I'm expecting too much, is it? It's not that you're expecting too much. Have you had a discussion with your manager about that particular action? When it was done before, yes. All right, so there's nothing wrong with, not in a confrontational way, but using iMessages, I noticed that X and Y was done, but I would really prefer if it was done this way because A, B, C. Instead of you keep doing this, you did it already. I spoke with you and you still did it again. No. But to say, okay. I would prefer if it is done this way because this is how this action affects me. Okay. All right, thank you for sharing. So mind reading, I know exactly what you're thinking about me. So persons look at people and decide that, guess what, I can read your mind. Go ahead, Miss Barnes. Um, thank you. I just wanted to contribute to the, pre the prior conversation. Yes. Um, because I have been in that space where a coworker of mine spoke to me about a situation that I had done something that they, they were concerned about. And I, I had a similar reoccurrence again of the situation. And I, I can say from that perspective that I realize that behavior change don't happen overnight. Yes. And yes, you may have had the conversation, but we do have moments where from our perspective, we slip into that era where our comfort is, and we we may utilize that as our coping or responding mechanism. And it's sometimes nothing to do with you, the individual, but how we cope and how we are trying to frame what we the space we work in. And I, from that perspective, I can say to you that it's something that takes time to build, and be gentle and patient with your manager because we have there are human reflexes that you may go back to you may revert to those behaviors where you where, where you feel safe and it's nothing against you sometimes a personal situation and the person has to work on themselves to come into that expectation that you have from the conversation that you had with them and it will manifest maybe not as quickly as you so desire but as the person grows and builds trust with you as well and, and becomes a little bit more vulnerable in this space as a leader. So it, it takes a little while. Thank you. Good point. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Dong. Yes, thank you. Um, following up with um, the point that was raised, um, in, I think it was what, module four, um, there was a, a letter, a, a podcast rather, um, that um, a gentleman was relating an experience that happened with his manager where um, the manager was supposed to appoint someone to do some reports and the manager needed to do that. And when the manager's boss asked the manager why the things weren't sent, he blamed one of his subordinates, who is the person I was talking, basically threw him under the bus. And when he heard, he was upset because he was thinking, but he was never told he should do whatever. So how is it, how is the manager saying it's his fault? So he said that he didn't, he didn't um, jump on it right away. Like he took like a, a few days to, to process, to think about it. And then when he wasn't as angry, right, he went to the manager and he, instead of like saying, as I said, you did, you did, you did, like he said to him that this thing happened and, um, I was wondering why you did this or he said such so, and such. And the, um, he said, that, you know, honestly, it felt made me feel so and so. And so the manager's response to him was, I, I, I thank you for your honesty in coming to me with this. And he explained that, um, you know, it's something that, 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 that slipped him. But, um, and he also offered a solution. The, the person that was blamed wrongfully 
offer a solution that maybe that's something they should work on to um, delegate someone who is always responsible for this at a particular point in time so that it doesn't happen in the future. And he and the manager had a great working relationship after that. Mm. So if he had um, done what, well, okay, I probably would have done in the situation, not knowing this, and just jump on a business manager for throwing him out of the boat when he was not at fault, then maybe we would have ended up with an enemy in the company, yes. right? So yes. sometimes you have to be the bigger person, and you never know what, as I just said, conflict also brings up new things that you never thought of before, right? Yeah. So that's just, it's like, I just said, we're perfectly imperfect and we make mistakes. So just like we, the golden rules do to others as you'd have them do to you, we are going to make mistakes at some point in time. Yes. And we're yes. going to want grace. So let us give grace so that we can achieve grace like this all the time. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, And the other thing is that when we use iMessages, when we communicate with others, it is almost a guarantee that we'll end up with a win-win situation, right? So the next type of stinking thinking is personalization, where every, we, we interpret, again, coming back to our interpretation of activities, we interpret everything that other persons do as a personal attack on me. So if someone has up a WhatsApp status, um, we just automatically believe that my name is in there when it has nothing, it says nothing, nothing about Megan. And we take it on and we begin to think a lot of negative things. And then once we begin to think negative things, we are going to be experiencing stress. Then emotional reasoning, you accept your emotions as evidence for the truth. So because I am thinking this and I, I, I just think that, you know what? I feel this, this came in my spirit. My spirit never wrong yet. Who me? Mm -hmm. You see, anytime I go against my spirit, what my spirit tell me, that's when I get into trouble. And so we rationalize things and we use all of these proverbs and we accept our emotions as evidence of for the truth when many times our emotions do lie. So stinking thinking then, and there are other types. I just selected a couple for us to consider this evening. Stinking thinking hurts relationships because I am going to begin to negatively evaluate the people around me. I am going to negatively evaluate everything that people do. I'm going to take it as a personal attack. I am going to be focusing on all of the negatives and no one likes to be around a negative person, someone who is just always negative. Stinking thinking places us in what I call a mental prison and stinking thinking drains your energy. So people pulling away from you, that adds to the stress. Your relationship's not working out, that adds to the stress. You feel listless and tired all the time. You become very irritable, that adds to the stress. So to change stinking thinking, we have to one, practice unconditional self-acceptance. Recognize that you're a perfect, imperfect person. Recognize also that your boss is a perfect, imperfect person. Recognize that the people around you, they are perfect, imperfect people. So just like how you make mistakes, they will also make mistakes. Just like how sometimes you're corrected for one thing 10 times, they may need to be corrected 10 times too. The Bible says, if you who are spiritual, if, if a brother or a sister is overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual must restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering that you are also prone to the same temptations that they are. So it is recognizing that none of us are perfect. It is also recognizing that if I make mistakes, others will make mistakes too. Another is to differentiate between your W-O-R-K from your W-O-R-T-H. And it ties in with the first one. 
your W-O-R-K has nothing to do with your self-worth. You're worthwhile and valuable because you're created in the likeness and the image of God. Sometimes we, in terms of our W-O-R-K, sometimes we may do excellent work. Sometimes it may not be so excellent, but we never use our, our W-O-R-K to determine our sense of self-worth. And what, and, and as the golden rule says, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And then change your negative thoughts to more positive ones. It may seem challenging, but challenge does not mean impossible. Some other little um, everyday tips that we can use, exercise. Cannot say enough about exercising. Remember, I spoke about stress being a mind-body relation, having a mind-body relationship. When we exercise, it releases brain chemicals that make us feel good. Proper nutrition, eat right, eat on time these things help when we are hungry who is more irritable than someone who is hungry who is more irritable than someone who did not get enough sleep learn how to set limits learn how to set boundaries and stick with those boundaries connect with people not just to talk about work Human beings are intrinsically relational. We were created to relate to others. I mean, everyday conversation, check on people, check on your loved ones. Ensure that you have your hobbies and you practice your hobbies. Persons say, but I don't have any time. No, if you evaluate your 24 hours and look at some of the things that we do sometimes that we really don't have to. And we have to be careful of having that false sense of guilt when we sometimes take some time for ourselves. Invest in self-care. And if you find that you get to the place where you're feeling overwhelmed, find somebody to talk to. Talking helps. It helps. I cannot say enough about that. There are counselors, there are friends, there are persons who you can talk with. Find somebody to talk with. And finally, when you, it, um, Norman Vince Peel says, when you change your thoughts, change your thoughts and you will change your world. And at this point, I ask if there are any questions or comments. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson, Karen Johnson. Hello, sorry, yes. I did not mute my mic. I, I just want to thank you for this exercise tonight. I'm very happy that I joined the class. And I just want to know if you're going to set the slides for us. <laughs> Because I will add uh, the recording because I would like to listen to it over again. Oh well, uh, as Mrs. Mattox will have access, will have the recordings. I'm not sure if they share it with the participants. Oh, okay. We'll have to speak with Mrs. Mattox or if she can address that. I, I thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes, certainly, Karen. We'll have it available for you. All right. I am not seeing another hand. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Oh, Dr. I'm not sure how this name is pronounced. O-F-R-E, please go ahead. Good night, everyone. Good night. It's, uh, and it's Ofre, O-F-R-E, Ofre. Ofre, okay, thank you. Um, it's an amazing session. Um, I think, this is quite very important for each and every one of us. And I think that very important for perhaps uh, people that perhaps we report to and other persons that are in high authority, perhaps than we are, because it could be very, very draining, I would say, when you are the only one pouring in. 
and not receiving, it could be very challenging, it could be very, very overwhelming. I just hope and only wish that every other, every other person can actually receive this training, this lecture, this information we are receiving here to make it more uh, a two-way street and a one-way. Yes. You know, because when it's always a one-way, a relationship that is only uh, import in and not being poured on as well, it could get very overwhelming. But I just hope that some way, somehow, we will be stronger in our expression, as in, in exhibiting all what we just learned and do our best to have our very, even when it's very challenging. But thank you so much for this amazing information you provided. It's quite, uh, quite interesting. And we would walk towards abiding by it. Thank you. Awesome, you are welcome. All right, so thank you everyone for logging in this evening. Thank you for participating. And I now turn back over to the moderator. All right, thank you so much. Dr. Swaby, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Can I have some virtual claps going up for Dr. Swaby tonight? Yes, certainly. She has done a wonderful job, wonderful presentation, Dr. Swaby. We really appreciate your, you, you spending the time with us um, on this evening. Certainly, a lot of us will make a conscious decision to get rid of some of those thinking, thinking, right, and to think more positively concerning our place of work, even though it might be challenging, but making that conscious decision to think positively definitely will assist us with our mental health and our health in general. Just to let you know as well that we have Dr. Subi for the rest of the year, so please take note of the dates for our webinars. We'll be having our on November 16th, where we'll be looking at um, uh, setting boundaries to prevent burnt out. So stay tuned for that. We'll be sending out our flyers. Stay tuned to our social media platforms where we'll be having all those posted if you haven't been receiving emails from us, certainly you can just type your email in the chat and we will add you to our email listing. Also to remind you that CTEC offers free mental health services. So reach out to us, we're here for you. Our webinars aren't just what we offer, we offer free services. We have our psychologists on board if it is that you need to talk, if it is that you have your team, team at work that needs group counseling, we do offer such services. We have our chat bot available, right? So you just come on, reach out to us. We're here to assist you. Certainly, I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen to that you see our social media platforms that we have available that you can um, check us out on, follow us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, on YouTube. We will be sending out the recording as well um, to your emails. So if it is that you are a recipient of emails, you will get that recording in your inbox. If you're not, just kindly send us, um, just, just type your email here in the chat and we will have you to our email listing. So thank you so much again. Stay tuned to or um, social media pages for further updates on our mental health services that we have offering. Just want to pause to also say congratulations to Ramona Grant. Ramona Grant is the recipient of our giveaway on last week. So definitely stay tuned to our, our social media platforms where you'll be able to win prizes and uh, surprises right also want to con congratulate rather um gail reed who is one of our participants here and tonight gail is always supporting what we do here at ctech all our mental health services and so we have a prize for you also gail so you will receive that shortly all right so um book it on your calendar november 16th same time um same link and join us all right have a good evening everyone thank you again dr swaby thank you everyone for logging on tonight and remember 
We're getting rid of our stinking thinking. All right. Have a good night. Same to you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.